today, not tomorrow, but as surely as a man is sent home from a hospital with an incurable disease to live out his days as comfortably as he can, America is finished. Fred, aren't you a little worried about your box office making statements like that? Perhaps you've noticed my current picture makes a very powerful statement. The truth is a weapon greater than dollars. Maybe Brett's trying to jolt the sleeping giant. Shake the American people up. Ah, oh, yes, we, the American people. The most naive, arrogant, manipulated, insecure, pathetic flock of sheep in history. The whole world is laughing behind our backs, and all we hear is applause. They'll take until it's all gone, and we'll give until we're empty. And then? They'll step on us. Oh, it's full of it. What was that? Patriotism from one of America's disenfranchised? Who's disenfranchised? I didn't jump a war or run away from home. I came here to work. You have so many young patriots running around Europe. I wonder what's so wrong with the greatest nation on Earth. You got that right. I wouldn't dismiss what Easton is saying so quickly. I think he's right. The United States is finished. You know something? You've got a lot of nerve talking about America, coming from the biggest bust in history. Tanny is too grand a name. They ought to call your country the Titanic. <laughs> You're right. England's finished, too. At least I'm willing to defend my country. The trouble with you guys from that dying island is there isn't anyone left to try and save it. Well, how long since you've been home? Oh, go to hell. Easton is right. America is finished. What are your plans? I leave for home tonight. But the Cannes Film Festival begins in two days. Your picture's got the best chance of winning of any European entry. I'll be back in time for the screening. But what could possibly be so important that it could... I'll answer those questions at a later date. Now, the bar is still open. I've got a lot of arrangements to make, so have a drink. Okay. Okay. Hello? Yes, sir. I'm certain now that that's the thrust of the manuscript. My trip's all arranged. I just had to be sure. No, I'll get it. Yes, I'm leaving tonight. Why are we bothering with this man? You are overreacting to a small piece of information that uh, it could mean our success or failure. It's too close, so close that we've got to find out. What if it is our blueprint, or close enough? Then we put a lid on it. If he's coming to Cannes, he may already have a deal. Deals can be broken. Fabrizio, if you had your way, all the people in the world would be dead except a few of your very close personal friends, and they'd have to be very, very careful. You don't understand the rules. When it comes to games, I understand them very well. I'm a winner, Fabrizio. You are a loser. You're hot-headed. You're impulsive. You don't know when to take one step backward in order to move ten forward. What are we doing now? We're about to embark on the most momentous task of our lives. It will happen. And Jesse Craig? Get insurance for Jesse Craig. I always enjoy going home. I hope Pat is still working in the Regency Plaza Hotel. Her kind of decadence I love. to see the house at our leisure. I understand this was his wife's house. Aren't they divorced? Yes, some years now. Mr. Craig agreed to house sit while he's in town. And he's in Martha's Vineyard. Mm. They have a house there as well. Well, maybe we ought to be looking for a house there then. It's in Connecticut. Right. Somewhere near Bel Air, isn't it? <laughs> Somewhere near Bel Air. Your performances must be very amusing. Right. My music's a real giggle. Can't we unload this twit? If you'll notice the craftsmanship in these moldings and the beautiful floors. 
crowd all have to come out anyway, wouldn't it? Come out. Deco, mate. Oh, Deco. This would be my music room. Well, there are a lot of rooms. Perhaps the projection room would convert more easily to your needs if you follow me. Hello, what's that? Sounds like a flaming party. Mr. Craig must be showing a film. If you'll follow me this way, we can see the rest of the house without disturbing him. Showing a film? Jesse Craig was a famous producer. Never heard of him. What happened? He ran out of petrol. It's all right. The whole world is, you know. If we could move along, I do have one other appointment. I think you've offended him. Well, he don't come with the house, does he? The judgments we have considered, anguished over, and finally adjudicated here at Nuremberg will speak long after each one of us, defendants and jurors alike, have been rendered unto dust, and will testify more explicitly than any rhetoric set forth in this courtroom whether man is a creature of the pack, an unthinking, unfeeling herd animal, or is he being created in God's own image, capable of independent thought, selflessness, charity, for God's sake, some small measure of decency, compassion for his fellow man. The human race will judge not the defendants here at Nuremberg in centuries to come. Rather, they will judge us, the jurors. I pray that their verdict will find us to be capable, thoughtful, honest men, who accepted their responsibility and found the courage to try to do the right thing. Is there anything else I can do for you, Jesse? No, I guess I'm finished. Thank you. Sure, there's nothing else I can do. No, no, Danny. You know, I really appreciate you taking the time to run the film for me. I didn't know who else to ask. I've been out of this town for such a long time. Did I complain? No, I know you didn't, but it's still a little awkward to ask a friend to give up their Saturday morning for me. Hey, hey, that's what friends are for, right? Besides, I love to see your films. Thank you. Listen, you've seen most of the stuff that's come out of the studios lately. Now, how does this stand up, really? Well, it was sobering to see it again. Yeah. It's more than great. It's an important film. Mr. Craig, I think I have some good news for you. Yeah, I like your house. Crazy about it, it's more to work. It's got to be a real giggle fixing up this old place. Ruddy's the name, Michael Ruddy. Did you tell Mr. Ruddy what my ex-wife is asking for it? Yes, I... A million too, won't it? Bit steep for the old shanty. Yes, and despite the bank's devotion to this area, the most they'll likely loan you is $500,000, you see. You'd have to come up with a difference. No, nah, we won't be bothering with no banks, mate. I don't trust them. Mr. Ruddy's prepared to pay cash. He hasn't put the offer in writing yet, but... Uh... Oh, there's no need to make an offer. No, Penny wants full price. But an offer of a million cash? Well, Penny has always been... Well, she's always been sort of fond of cash. It's got to be the right offer, you see. Man's right. The house is worth a million, too. You drive an hard bargain old stick, but I guess that's it. A million, too, it is. Congratulations. You've unloaded the old barn. How long have you been divorced, Jess? Well, long enough to forget about it, that's for sure. She's still with the same fella? Oh, probably not. When they get over 40, she starts looking around for a younger vintage. And then she's got half everything I own. She can afford a lot of looking. Hey. Hey, sure you don't mind driving me to the airport, huh? Not at all. Tell me about your new project. What size scale? It's about as big as you can imagine. Sounds ambitious. It is. I'm going to produce the end of the world.
you think of our film, Mr. Craig, considering it wasn't American to me? What? Brett Easton. The terrorist, Monsanto, in the film. The one with the uh, beard and the hand grenade. That was a very effective disguise you had on there. And the movie, did you, did you find it effective? Disturbing. Just the movie. Was it? Well, it's based on true events, but the intent of the film was, was purely entertainment. Have you ever considered that a film like that could uh, also be instructional? You mean good triumphs over evil? Now, you're a very naive man. I'm sorry. Of course I know what you mean. Those young men that were killed at the Olympics, they were serving their country. And it was an important story that needed to be told, just like ours was. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me something. You know, Clint Eastwood, Charles Bronson, you, you went off to Europe and you became major stars, but the other two returned home. You didn't. Why? Hmm. Call it loyalty. They had faith in me when nobody else did. I couldn't get arrested back home. And that made you bitter, right? No, reflected. You know, America acts as if it's the only country in the world. Sometimes European pictures, they, they have a better lock on reality. Well, sometimes it takes others to make you look at yourself and see the truth. Whose idea was that uh, legend on the end of the film? It troubled you? Yeah, encouraging people to kidnap, terrorize, and murder innocent people. Yes, that troubled me. Do you think the rich of our country know that the poor exist? Do they really care? Do they raise one little finger to save the child who die of starvation? I mean, even as we eat caviar and drink fine wines on this luxury flight to the French Riviera. Well, the thought doesn't seem to have dulled your appetite. The true measure of communism is that all of its people should have champagne and caviar, not poverty. I mean, they should all live. As well as you do. That was my legend you saw in the film at the end. What does your message mean, really? Is man an unfeeling, unthinking herd animal, just bent on satisfying his base instincts? Or is he capable of independent thought, selflessness, charity and compassion for his fellow man? I'm flattered you remember my last film, but I think you interpreted charity and compassion a little differently than I'd intended. How often in the Bible did God have to slew man, woman, and child alike in order to preserve the righteous. That was God. He has a better fix on exactly who the righteous are. I doubt if it's anybody in this airplane. Certainly not anybody in first class. Here's to the righteous, Mr. Craig. I'm looking forward to continuing our encounter in Canada. I assume that's where you're going. Yes, yes, that's right. I'm sure that the film community will welcome you back with open arms. As long as they're not holding clenched fists. <laughs> I think they're really interested in an actor's opinion. That's all, guys. Mr. Craig, welcome to France. Gail McKinnon. Yeah. Disgusting, wasn't it? Our handshake? <laughs> the priorities of the press. Well, the press's priorities are private prerogative. Hmm, illiterate. You should have been a writer, not a producer. Should have? Well, the late Mr. Craig thanks you very much, Miss... Uh... McKinnon. McKinnon. Mean we started off on the wrong foot. I may not be much of a greeting party, but at least I cared enough to be here. Just where are we going after this, uh, this fine beginning? Well, you are on your way to the Carlton Hotel. And I thought after a suitable interval, say, first thing in the morning, you'd be kind enough to grant yeah, me. My name's Craig, Jesse Craig. I requested a convertible if you have one. Moment, s'il vous plaît, monsieur. Scruff 
happy as I may appear, I do send radio blurbs back to the States. Little capsules from the continent. Well, I doubt if there's much interest in me there. You're wrong. Anyway, that's not the entire point of the interview. I'd like to do an in-depth magazine article. Mm -hmm. Which magazine? I don't know yet. It's my first magazine article. Well, now, I wish you the very best, uh, miss, but uh, I'm afraid I'm not interested. I think you'll change your mind, Mr. Craig, once you've looked at these. They're about you. I'm afraid you're out of luck because I, I detest reading about myself. Don't lie. Well, now, you do have a way of ingratiating yourself, don't you? Look at these in your spare time. I think you'll be impressed. Now, is there anything else that you'd like me to do, Miss McKinnon? Well, I could use a ride to Con. We both seem to like convertibles. That does give us something in common. This is uh, Gail McKinnon. She's a very persistent young reporter. There's more than a story here, Mr. Craig. There's a person. Very nice to meet you, Mr. Murphy. I'll be talking with you. Well, let's have a drink. Oh, I was about to join Sonia. No, that can wait. Jesse Craig! Don't tell me the festival's going to have a little class this year. Well, suppose we keep that a secret, huh? How are you, Bill? I'm fine, just fine. You got a picture in the festival? No, but we're running every night at the Star on Rue d'Antibes. Come on down. I think you'll like it. I'd be delighted. Are you here to sell or just to watch the flesh auction? Nostalgia. See some old friends. Might have a deal to make. Well, if you need any interim financing, let me know. I've got a lot of Brazilian money ready to go. Uh, Jesse, uh, will you excuse us? I'll remember that. Really good to see you, Jesse. Don't make it so long next time. He'll never make a deal here. That little guy wouldn't have gotten past word one with you in the old days. Making pictures, Murph. That's why he's here. Yeah, why are you here? I have something in my suitcase I want to show you. Would you wait here a minute? Yeah. Your bags are already in the suite you requested, monsieur. All right, thank you. Conditioning has been up. Energy conservation is also very important to us here in Europe. If you open these doors, you will find that in a very few moments the breezes from the ocean will. And may I say that you have the best view in Cannes? Come and see. Brings back a lot of memories. I'm not sure I want to. Remember all of them. Ooh. 
Thank you for your trouble. I have to run downstairs. Merci. Um, have an enjoyable stay, monsieur. All right. to see you again, Mr. Craig. Well, it's entirely mine, Henri. I'll have a... Uh, Gin and tonic and crushed eyes. Well... And for Mr. Murphy? Oh, uh, Barry, uh, a beer. Okay. <coughs> There's a script that I want you to read. Sure. Who wrote it? Well, it's a new writer. It's his first screenplay. Uh-huh. You got an option? Oh, that's no problem, you see. But you've got to read it tonight. You and nobody else, you understand? Tonight? Oh, come on, Jess. I'll be lucky to finish out the night on one piece. Those parties that Sonia's got planned for us to swing by and... Make the time, Murph. Look, I need to know what you think about it, and I need to know as soon as possible. What's come over you? You've been out of circulation for years. Only a waiter with 10 years' service would know that your drink is gin and tonic and crushed ice. And suddenly you come up with a uh, property that's this hot? Yes. Yes. Properties like that, you just don't find them under rocks. They're usually kicked around for a while. Who's seen it? No one. And less than a handful will know the ending, even while it's being done. What a mystery. Huh? You're pretty theatrical. Murph is probably the most important subject that I've ever been connected with. What's it about? Read it. Well, give me a hint. Read it. I don't think I've ever seen you this excited. Not even in the old days when you had something to be excited about. It's good to have you back, Jesse. Just help me get it made. <laughs> Speaking of the old days, oh, what I wouldn't give. You better not let Sonia hear you talking that way. <laughs> Sonia. She'd give up her blue hair dye if she thought this flying machine could get airborne once again. Oh, now, I can recall when you did pretty good between the car hops and the meter maids. And... <laughs> oh, I see. I wonder who's lucky enough to get his overflow. Well, oh, yeah. isn't this a lucky day? Here I have the good fortune, or bad, of having a couple of extra ladies and running into a couple of guys who are all alone. <laughs> Brett Easton? Yes, I know. Mr. Mr. Craig. This is the second time in one day. I consider that an omen. Uh, well, unfortunately for uh, Murph here, he has a, a very pressing engagement. Oh, you don't run into old friends like this every day. Good, good. Then it's a party. Well, you know, I'm very sorry. I can't stay. I really am. But I uh, have some phone calls to make and uh, maybe another time. It was very nice to meet you uh, again, Mr. Easton. Ladies, maybe another time. Uh, Jesse, are you sure? Well, now, there's no reason why you shouldn't stick around to Murph. Uh, just uh, don't forget the script, right? Gotcha. Another time, Mr. Craig. Mm -hmm. Another time. Well, where do we go from here? Merci. May I suggest my villa? Michelle and Tanya here know the way very well. Don't forget your script. I'll take care of Henri. No, no. Make sure that they keep him busy. Now, there's a Xerox machine in the office of the hotel. I'll arrange to have it open. Then I've got a very special job for you. <laughs> to the general public, the word producer has certain connotations. A movie producer is likely to be a portly gentleman with a cigar in his mouth, a peculiar vocabulary, and a distasteful penchant for starlets. But there have been many gifted producers. Goldwyn, Zanuck, Selznick, Ponty, Jesse Craig. In 1946, Craig, then age 24, first presented D-Day at Normandy, a motion picture acclaimed as one of the finest ever made about the Second World War. Between...
1946 and 1966, Craig produced 10 plays and more than 15 movies, a high proportion of them critical and commercial successes. Since 1967, no production bearing his name has been seen either on the stage or screen. How can the circus still be busy to Paris? It's not like I'm trying to call New York, you know. There's a film festival going on. Yes, here. I understand there's a festival going on. That's why I'm here. It's very difficult to get through. Yes, but would you keep trying? I'll be in my room all evening. And uh, don't put through any other calls, will you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Have you read the first few pages yet? May I ask how you managed to get through to me? I left explicit instructions not to be disturbed. I told him you were expecting my call. I knew you had to be expecting some call. No one comes to the festival to hide in his room. They asked me if I was Constance Dobson. I told him I was. I don't know where you get the nerve to start prying into my life, Miss McKinnon. It is not nerve, it's interest. There's a very interesting section about Constance. It's on page 14. Now, look, I have no intention of waiting through any of your pages. Now, you're wasting your time. That's all right. I have a lot of it to spare. I hope you like what you read. I put a lot of work into it. Goodbye. I first met Constance Dobson in Paris. Robert Kennedy seemed the embodiment of a new spirit and idealism based on compassion and tenacity. Constance Dobson immediately commanded Craig's attention. She was vibrant, alive, ageless, attractive and compelling. In Paris, she was the best American girl. The American vote abroad is vital. Do you know how many Americans there are just living here in Paris who support the senator's campaign? No. If we could pick up a few thousand votes as we cross Europe, this entire trip could be a turning point. What do you think? I think he's the best thing to come along in my whole life. Jesse, old man. Nice to see you in a brawl like this. You're here to give generously to the cause. Mm. You think the cause needs it? Every little bit helps, old man. Mm. Oh, I see that you're on the senator's team. Polishing up his speeches. Getting the ferocity out of him. <laughs> Replacing it with controlled passion. Oh, yeah. You ever seen so many sweating parasites in your life, deluding themselves? They're really working for a cause, what? an ideal, a set of principles. Wait a, minute, wait a minute. As long as that's what they believe, then fine. They believe it because he believes in it. The man's got charisma coming out of his ears. He can charm you in one minute and chill your veins in the next. There's a hell of a novel in that man. Probably three or four. Uh, no doubt as to who you'll be choosing as a biographer. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Ian. Of course, that won't be until he's president. That's a long campaign. And frankly, I'm here on emergency rations. Threw a yellow pad, some socks, and aftershave into a suitcase and turned Mother's picture to the wall. Don't write it out for me, Ian. Just spell it out, huh? A couple of bucks to tide me over. You know I'm good for it. You're a leech. Well, even leeches have friends. How much is a couple of bucks? Two thousand. Two thousand. Well, I don't give donations to lost causes. But if I thought that you were going to sit on the beach and finally finish that novel you've been picking at for the last five years, I'd reconsider. I'm getting to. You'll never get to it. What are you talking about? Old wounds don't heal on you, do they, Jesse? They heal. Slowly. Uh, 
there'll be another night, old man. Constance, it's good to see you again. It's nice to see you, Senator. I've been hearing very good things about your work here in Paris with your drug rehabilitation program and that you're part of the organizers here tonight. It didn't take a lot of organizing. You have a name that precedes you, Senator. All the people here tonight are here because they really care. I appreciate that. Excuse me. Of course. Jesse Craig. That's right, Senator. I'm an admirer of your work, sir. It's good to have you here with us. I'd like to talk to you while I'm in Paris. I'd like that. Hey! Do you take donations? Certainly we do, Mr. Craig. Well, it's very generous. Senator Kennedy will be grateful. Share that smile. <laughs> it just seems kind of comic for somebody to be getting a, a member of the Kennedy family a five hundred dollar check. <laughs> All right. Don't you believe in what the senator's trying to do? Well, when I'm abroad, I usually say I'm a Republican. That makes them less nervous. That's if I don't retreat altogether and say I'm a Canadian. That cancels out all hatred. What are you doing in Paris? Just uh, passing through. Would you like to buy me a drink? All right. Gin and tonic on the rocks. Lots of ice. And uh, another glass of champagne for Mr. Craig. And he likes just a little crushed ice on the bottom. Hey, you must be watching me pretty close. You were aware of that, Mr. Craig. <sighs> well, now you have me at a disadvantage. I'm Constance Dobson. I live in a modest apartment on the Champs-Élysées. I work with the drug addicts you've heard about. <laughs> and I'm never later than 8.15 at my desk, no matter what kind of a night I've spent. I'm very partial to green olives. Shall we find a place a little less crowded with emotion? You know, there's something very special about Kennedy. Exciting. The young see that. They like him. Maybe they know something. Well, they're generally a lot more open to the truth. Is this what we came out here to talk about? Are you going to kiss me now, or are you going to wait until later? I'm going to kiss you now. about the breakup. I, I think it was in some fan magazine. <laughs> Not much of an epitaph for 20 years, is it? <laughs> what happened? Well, it was times when I needed Penny and it was times when she needed me. Unfortunately, those times didn't coincide. That's, that's... Magazine said you left you high and dry. No, more than dry. She... Bloodless is a better word. Wasn't a drop left by the time her lawyer got through squeezing. Was it another man? Other men. Younger men. You stay in Paris. Yeah, for sure, well. Will you come back? Will you give up your fella? much too soon. I couldn't give it and you couldn't handle it. One day at a time. Yeah. You know, I've never really seen Paris. I'll take you everywhere you want to go. Be part of me, Jesse.
Why the hell didn't you call me last night like you said you would? Look, I tried to get you, but the lines to Paris were busy. All night? I've been waiting here like a recluse. Well, I was... I was thinking about you, honey. I'm flattered. I thought you might have wanted me to join you. Well, I, I hadn't considered that. Obviously. But remembering the first night we met. Save your excuses. You haven't even got the decency to lie. I certainly hope you found somebody to hold your hand in Cannes because your franchise has run out in Paris. Connie, will you be reasonable? At this moment, I am purely, coldly, and glacially reasonable. I'm taking the phone off the hook, Mr. Craig, so you can make your deals, put your projects together, but don't try to renew old acquaintances because you don't know anyone who wants to know you anymore. She certainly sounded upset. You could have heard her out in the corridor. How'd you get in here? I told the maid I forgot my key. Now look, Miss McKinnon. I worry about you older fellows. You don't seem to adjust as well to jet lag. <laughs> You're going to be late for your lunch date with your agent. How did you know about my lunch date? I ran into him last night at Brett Easton's villa, and he invited me. I just wondered if I could get a ride. But if it's too much trouble, I'll get there somehow. Well, does it fit into your plans for me to shower and shave? I've got all the time in the world. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? We had to move the crates out of the warehouse. The police were closing in. And you just brought them to the first logical place you could think of, is that it? For a short time. Just how long do you think it would take Ledoux or any of his men to search this villa? They are watching me day and night. Don't you know that? This is just the evidence that Ledoux needs to nail me. Now, you better get these crated up and out of here fast. My comrade. What? Our comrades are rotting away in jail while we do nothing. We are united in a purpose. One purpose. Nothing and no one else matters. A third power will emerge from the ashes of false idealism. Our power. When the time is right, we'll strike. And that time approaches very rapidly. Until then, we remain anonymous. Now get those out of here. And we think we know Easton's every move. He knows ours. His network would make the resistance look disorganized. And no trace of where they might have taken any arms? None. We could try the villa. No, it's a waste of time. Easton's too smart for that. We've got to stop that man. Well, you tell me how. <sighs> there is nothing we can do but watch and wait and watch and wait and watch and wait until it is too late. Yes, but for what? When we have the answer to that, my friend, we can move against. And in the meantime? In the meantime, we keep a very close eye on Jesse Craig, just the way Easton has been doing. Well, what is their connection? Whatever it is, I believe it to be a dangerous one for Mr. Craig. Come. <laughs> discouraged very easily, do you, Miss McKinnon? How long is it going to take you before you call me Gail? Oh, probably until I find out what you really want from me. Well, I want a story. I told you that. The story of Jesse Craig, one of the foremost filmmakers in the world. You have got a script that you're uh, hoping to launch here in uh, Cannes. No, no, I'm looking for scripts. Oh, including the one you're hiding. Uh, which one is that? The one you gave Murph last night. Is there anything you don't know about me? Well, I don't know if you have a sense of humor. Ah. 
Why do you wear them damn things? What, you mean my shades? Yeah. You don't like them? No, I don't like them at all. Oh. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, much. <laughs> I don't believe it. A human emotion. There may be hope for you yet, Mr. Craig. How long is it going to take you to call me Jesse? As soon as you tell me your life story. Well, what makes you think anybody wants to read it? Well, you have an important script. All I want is to be at the beginning of an epic movie that's going to be a definitive answer. Of what? You'll tell me sooner or later. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you? I'm very sure of you. Hi, Sonia. I believe both of you know uh, Miss Gail McKinnon. Yeah, you were right about her persistence. She tracked me down last night, interviewed me about you. So I understand. Jesse, I read it. What do you think? Dynamite. Do we dare do a picture like this? We don't dare not to. This guy, Malcolm Hart. I never heard of him. Well, he's up and coming. Can he adapt it? Why should he adapt it? There are always further versions on any script. You know, I don't need to tell you that. This canvas is uh, so big. Well, further, drafts are no problem. No, no, I mean fast. While we're here in Cannes, this is the most explosive piece of material I've read in 10 years. I don't wonder you were twisting my arm to get me to read it last night. Finance can be arranged right here. Now, can you get the guy here? He'll be here. Why can't you tell me who he is? Oh, well, you wouldn't know him. It's not important, but uh, I can handle it, all right? Well, I'm getting this material over to Walter Klein this afternoon. Why Klein? Well, if nothing else, he knows how to raise dough. That African picture cost nine million, still skyrocketing. Klein knows how to sell a big budget picture like this, and my God, do you have any idea what this picture's gonna cost to do? If I hear another word, I'll explode. What is this picture about, Mr. Craig? Well, I'm afraid I can't uh, talk to the press about it yet, uh, Miss McKinnon. <clears throat> well, I'll keep it strictly confidential. Until, of course, the Hollywood Reporter doesn't. Well, I'm surprised you haven't told me that you've already read the script and uh, object to the wide-angle shot on page 42. Well, I'll get to read it somehow, somewhere. I would just rather do it with your permission. Well, why change now? Well, I, I've ordered lobster. How does that sound? Oh, I love it. I like to crack claws. Jesse, uh, why don't you and I meander over to the bar, uh, leave the girls to a cozy little pre-lunch slander session. I want to talk to you. Uh, I'll bring you some drinks. Oh, I don't drink before night. Oh, thank you. Journalists were different in my day. They also looked different in bathing suits. Murph, no more than... Remember, this is the tropics. <laughs> Where my drinking is concerned, my wife thinks the tropics start just below Labrador. You go to bed with her? I hadn't thought about it. Well, think about it. Jesse, the movie industry is bankrupt. No money, no talent, no guts. Uh, four champagnes, please. Wall-to-wall -wall pornography. Jesse, any kid today, just over withdrawal, 120 pages under his arms, and a franchise and the Apache Indians can get a picture thrown together. Well, that's why I'm so excited about your project. Something has finally grabbed you by the heels. Jesse, this used to be your town. I'm going to make it your town again. This script is going to set this obsolete, dinosauric, atrophied resort on fire. It's going to bring you back into the fold. I just don't know if I want to go to bed with Walter Klein. You do have some other attractive alternatives. She's a child, Murph. Same age as my daughter. Sure, sure. Jesse, Red Easton has a yacht out in the harbor. He's giving a party tonight. Walter Klein will be there. Hmm? We could put this deal together tonight. Eight o'clock. Just like that? Just like that. Well, how do you find Mr. Craig's script? 
dangerous enough to kill him. What are we going to do about it? Kill it. We're just going to have to kill Jesse Craig. Sorry to stop, but there's an old memory here. You rented a villa between Antibes and the Cap. I know. The spring of 47. That was when D-Day at Normandy had won three Academy Awards and you married one of the leading ladies. Look, if you know so much about me, why are all these questions, huh? I know facts, Mr. Craig. Oh, I can gather my information from people, have your personality refracted and distorted a hundred different ways. But I want the truth from you. There it is. Oh, it's beautiful. It must have been wonderful to sit on that terrace with a, a new bride and a new career. You've won. We've won. What are you talking about? The movie, the awards. Here, read it for yourself. Congratulations. Collected all three. Best picture, best editing, best sound. Next time, let's go for broke. Get out of the sunshine and back to work. Love you both, Murph. Well, that's terrific. That's terrific? That's all you can say is that's terrific. It's fantastic. It's incredible. And I love you for it. Aren't you excited, for God's sakes? Yes, sure I'm excited. What's the matter? I was just thinking, we've accomplished nothing. Allies will become enemies, enemies, allies shift in emphasis. And the United States is the world's agent. Well, we'll continue to pump aid into Italy until she's fat enough to turn. Then we'll go back to firing bullets. Germany will rebuild, regroup. You see, we've seen that happen in this century. That's what the film should have stated, damn it, but it didn't. It won. You're the only dependable ideal that I can rely on. I love you. I'm so proud to love you. Was it a friendly divorce? As divorces go... The divorce in my family was silent, polite, and obscene. My mom wanted away one day. I was 16. She'd wanted away before, but uh, this time she didn't come back. It wasn't until I was 18 till I asked my father why. What did he say? He said she was looking for something. Something she couldn't find with him. You ever hear from her? Oh, I get a Christmas card every year from various places in Europe. I ought to look her up someday, see what kind of woman she's become. What kind of a woman was she before? Determined, outrageous, and beautiful. You would have liked her a lot. Why do I have this feeling that you knew everything that happened inside that villa that summer and that spring, huh? Oh, I didn't know everything. What, what do you know? What other surprises do you have in mind, huh? I know about your next movie. Oh, no, you don't. Mm -mm. <laughs> the End of the World. I don't believe it. No, no. How could you... You used a script service, didn't you? Rush order, ten copies, six girls on it to get it out to you in a hurry before you left for con. That's industrial espionage. You could go to jail for that, you know? I didn't read it. Mm -hmm. I just know about it. What makes you presume to know how the world is going to end? It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. People just don't want to think about it, that's all. But you see, you can't put an infinite number of bombs with an infinite number of matches into the same room and not expect one of them to ignite. Oh, especially when you add that extra ingredient of uh, lunatic fringes who want to see one of them go off. Oh, the Rand Corporation, you know, something that they call it the think tank. Well, they issued a paper that every terrorist group in the world is thinking nuclear. The world's got to come to a violent end unless someone does something about it. It's that simple. So we have to see the writing on the wall before it's too late. It's just a question of time before some city, Paris, London, New York, Los Angeles, is wiped off the face of the earth by some nut or, or group of nuts. And if you don't think they exist, just pick up any newspaper. Name the country. 
Any day of the month. Fortunately for you, the author of your screenplay has as much commitment as you do. Yes, he does. That's just a guess. No, it's not. It's a fact. You're Malcolm Hart. You wrote the screenplay, but you didn't want anybody to know about it. First dishonest chink I found in your armor. Thanks for the drink. I just left him. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I think I've got him. marketing my sex life as an industrial sleepy. Now, why don't I believe that? Because as a creative man, you can imagine the possibilities. Unfortunately, the young men in my life lack the vision or the experience to make me want to buy a ticket. Both, I think. Bless my soul. This must be a gathering of has been. Well, that's hardly fair. The girl's just getting started. If you're the best she can do, she's gonna make wrong way Corrigan look like Lindbergh. Let's see if I can update those references for you. Oh, that's all right. I was just going to get myself a Shirley Temple. You two have a nice reunion. So that's how you managed to keep up such a reasonable appearance despite the encroachment of old age. You look barely out of your forties. Well, as I recall, I am barely out of my forties. Oh, that's right. It was your father who helped Edison invent the movies. Well, if that's the best you can do, Ian, I suggest you stay away from pencils. They'll not be kind to you. They haven't been kind to me, old boy. But then you don't need talent to put pornography on film. I hear you have a hot new property by some new young writer. There's only one copy out of my personal control. Whoever's spreading those kind of stories is either a bill collector or a liar. Ah! The guest of honor. What a climb. We met several years ago at the awards in Hollywood. Oh, yes, I remember. Thank you for inviting me. It seems like a very nice party. Well, now that you're here, it is a party. I have a surprise for you. Will you come with me, please? Just this way. Excuse me. Gentlemen, the best filmmaker in the world, Jesse Craig. I am Mustafa Kamal, and these are my associates, Mr. Sine and Mr. Aston. How do you do? Please be seated. Thank you. Never before in my entire career, and it spans more years than I care to remember, never before have I been so impressed by a script. So much so that I immediately reached out for the most important combination of people I could find. Bring it to the screen with all the scope and splendor that's been intended by its author. Now, I realize we don't have a formal deal, Jesse. But I know that your word in Hollywood is gold. So I'm trusting you with my bank account as represented in person by these gentlemen here. They want to finance your picture as it is, as it was written. To do this picture well, you will need vast sums of money. Your preliminary budget is set at $12 million. Mm -hmm. I think a more realistic figure would be closer to 20. We are willing to say to you, forget the budget. Make the most powerful statement you can. You mean that's it? That's the deal? 
That's it. You know, I, I hate to be cynical, but I've always believed you had to work hardest for the things you wanted most. This is too good to be true. <laughs> you see, we should have worked together years ago. How about a toast? There you are. Uh, certainly not to World War III, but to our picture. Gentlemen. One small thing, Mr. Craig. I assume that it is customary that we may have some voice in the final shooting script. Well, I thought you were satisfied with it as an important document as written. Yes, of course, but you leave the catalyst which causes the final holocaust as vague and undefined. No, I think it's better that way, you know, to leave it in the audience's mind to decide which man's unhealthy trigger ended the world. I disagree. Let the trigger be one of the greatest powder kegs that exists in the world today. The Arab-Israeli conflict. And uh, who triggers the final holocaust? Well, as you say, it need not be wholly defined. Now, you're not telling me that it has to be the Israelis who precipitate the destruction of the world, are you? I'm simply saying that we arrive upon a final shooting script that we agree on that is satisfactory to both sides. Ah, I see. Well, that sounds acceptable. Uh, let me ask you this. Who approves the final cut of the film? Well, naturally, we'd have to have some word in it. I've been making pictures for a lot of years, Mr. Camel. We both know that no matter what's in the script, no matter what goes on the screen, you can cut a picture to come out any way you want. You can slant it in one direction or another. You have to enter an agreement on trust, Mr. Craig. I agree. The trick in eliminating mistrust is to have everything worked out up front. And what might be your upfront terms? I would retain possession of the negative of the film and final cutting of the picture. No one may touch the film after I have finished with it. Any businessman would tell you that in a transaction of this magnitude, such terms would be totally unacceptable. I don't think there's any doubt as to what your intentions are, sir. And I believe that I've made my intentions perfectly clear. I understand you haven't made a motion picture in some time, Mr. Craig. But this was to be your comeback, your return to prestige. Are you telling me that you're turning down $20 million? Yeah. I guess I am. Thank you for the wine. Mr. Klein, gentlemen. for a long time. When you gotta get some air, we got trouble. Big trouble. I knew Craig would never go for Klein's air appeal. So what do we do now? We come in with another source of money. Another source of money? Just the smoke screen. Enough to tie everything up, keep anybody else from becoming involved. And an excellent opportunity to pick a few special brains, my friend. After Mr. Craig has been removed from the picture. There's got to be... There's got to be some way to pull this deal back together. Uh, work out some agreement. The where only I... agreement that's going to satisfy them is their own complete control of the picture. I mean, hell. That's something I never gave away when I was making those B-horror thrillers for RKO. No, Bert, that's it. When you 
burn your bridges, you don't even leave a stick of charcoal behind. My well, father used to have an expression. Who cares? He used to say that everything seems darkest just before it goes completely black. He must have been a lot of laughs, too. Oh, Mr. Craig. Hmm? It's for you. Thank you. Yes, Jesse, I'm glad I caught you. I don't think we have anything to talk about, Walter. Jesse, I was as shocked as you were at the suggestion that they alter the script. Horrified is a better word. I mean, Jesse, for God's sake, my name is Clyde. I'd like to believe you, Walter, but you were in too much control of that meeting. Jesse, by all that's holy, you've got to believe me. I think you did exactly the right thing. Oh, by blowing the deal? By adhering to your principles. I want a man who has integrity and, and compassion and sensitivity. Does that surprise you? Well, frankly... Jesse, I made exploitation pictures. But that got me rich and overweight and a heart condition. I like to smoke good cigars. I like a lot of broads around me. I use favorites people owe me. I'm a stereotype. I like you. I also have a degree in psychology. I write poetry. I read everything I get my hands on. I know art. I just don't normally manufacture it. Well, I didn't know it could be manufactured. Sure it can. But every once in a while, you come across something very special. Your script is very special. This is the most important production I'll ever be connected with. Now, look, all we need is uh, to find another source of financing, that's all. The festival is still young. Well, I appreciate this, Walter. Jesse, I don't often get a chance to work with your class of producer. Let me enjoy it at my old age. Look, you take it easy, and I'll call as soon as I can come up with something. Good night, Walter. Well, we could be back in business. Yeah. Operator. Oh, operator? Yes, um, uh, get me Paris. Two six 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 eight nine one. This is Mr. Craig, Suite uh, 406. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'm sending Henri back there with 100 francs to get this call through right now. Thank you, right. Mr. Craig. Jesse, don't do this to me. What did he say? He's on our side. He could be handled. Jesse, you're getting me crazy. Hello. Hey, Constance? I thought I told you I didn't want to hear from you again. Why well, didn't you get my card? What card? Well, the one with the line cup. I said it reminded me of you. I got it. I tore it up, as I did every letter you ever sent me. I'm very busy. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't send for you right away, honey. Now, instead of your coming here, I thought maybe we could get away for a couple of days, just you and me. You did, did you? Where were you when I needed you? You can't go away. This is the best shot you've had in years. What's that supposed to mean, huh? It means that... It means you can't spend your time with fluffy young girls, then call me when you drop in from the far corners of the globe, expecting a tropical breeze and a warm body to lay by. Now, if you kept your fellas straight, you'd uh, recall that I've never been much on fluffy young girls. Now have I, huh? Just dilapidated old broads, huh? Jesse, have a heart. One more word out of you, Murph, and you're going to get that crush tax right in your ear. Constance. Don't say one word, Murph. Just don't. Operator. Oh, this is Mr. Craig in Suite 406. Yes, Mr. Craig. Yeah, no calls before 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Absolutely no exceptions, huh? Yes, sir. Good night. Okay, thank you. Oh, go to bed, will you, Murph? I don't feel like talking anymore tonight. I'll call you in the morning. Hello. Oh, man. What else can go wrong? Now, what the hell are you doing here at this hour? I brought some pages I wanted you to read. Now, look, I got my current affairs screwed up enough without reliving any past mistakes. Do you mind? Hmm? I'll just leave the pages I brought. You can glance at them in the morning. Look, I told you I have no intention of reading any of your pages, Gail. Gail?
For all the success and acclaim won by Jesse Craig for years of single achievements, he arrived in Cannes in the twilight of his life, a lonely man searching for a final victory, the denouement to a special life. Would you like me to stay? Yes. spoke to you that way. Uh, Constance, well, oh, wow, this is a surprise. I've changed my mind. A woman's prerogative, you know. A mature woman, that is, if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean. Last night you said... Last night I was being very petulant. I guess I was just annoyed because you didn't drop everything and call me the moment you landed in France. I didn't stop to consider that you've been out of things for nearly ten years. I'm sure you had a lot of adjustments to make. Well, a few... Point is... The point is, I'm sorry I accused you. Oh, let's not go into that, huh? Hey, how soon can you get here? I'm here. What? At the airport. I had to come down here to pick up one of my little problems. What is one of your little problems? A young American girl picked up on a narcotics charge. I think I've managed to keep her out of prison, though. You know the work I've been doing. Yes, yes. I can see you're anxious to hear all about it. I'll be there as quickly as I can. Well, don't hurry. You know, I've, I've got a few things to take care of. I, I, had a, I had a long night, you know, the first day back in the swing of things. You know, I mean, the, the, the back of, to work, you know. I can't wait to hear all about it. I'll uh, see you in the bar at noon, okay? Okay. It's 9.30. Yeah. Is there anything else I can do for you? Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. Hey, look. Uh, hey, don't worry about it. I'm liberated. <laughs> Not only that, I'm a member of the press. So if anything does get out about this, I can at least promise you accurate quotes. Could you come back in a few minutes? This will only take a few minutes. All right, come in. Inspector Ledoux, special sections. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Craig. I'm an admirer of yours. Well, thank you. Well, what's this all about? <laughs> it's not so easy to say, but I do the best I can. We uh, have been watching you. You have? Yes, ever since your arrival. What law have I broken? Oh, none that I know of. <laughs> At least none that I care about. What do you care about? France. Like a morning shoot? No, but go right ahead. I realize it's an imposition. And what I have to say is going to be even more imposing. No, just come right out with it. 
The French government would like you to go ahead with your financial arrangements with Mr. Klein and his oil interests. Hey, what is this? Everybody knows more about my business than I do. Well, actually, we know very little. Are you familiar with the American actor Brett Easton? Yeah, I've met him. He has a very large interest in you and your picture. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> he's never said anything to me about it. But uh, that has nothing to do with police business. No, the connection is gossamer at this point. That's why we would like you to go through with the proposition to see what it is they are up to. By they, you mean Brett Easton or Walter Klein or the Arabs? No, whoever. Mr. Easton has some questionable friends. A lot of movie stars have that problem. Exactly what is it you want me to do, Inspector? Should anything happen while you are here, anything you should feel disturbing, feel free to contact me. I appreciate your time. Mm. Enjoy your stay in Cannes. Bonsoir, Monsieur Craig. Mm -hmm. Gail? nothing of the conspiracy. You knew that before. There was always the possibility. I wanted to measure the men myself. Now I'm satisfied. However, if what I suspect is true, Mr. Craig could find himself in some danger. Did you warn him? I could not. Without incriminating the world famous men, I have no proof against Brad East. The suspicion. But if you're right... Yes, I know, I know. Well, the only thing we can do is keep our eyes on Mr. Craig, follow him wherever he goes. That will afford him some protection. Until we fully understand the game. As you wish. Hello. Hey, Mr. Jerry Olsen is on the line for you. Jerry Olsen? Oh, oh yes, put him on, operator. Hello. Jerry, how are you? I'm terrific. That's great. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Yeah, well, what's it all about? Well, I can't tell you about it over the phone. But meet me at the bar of the Carlton Hotel tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. I can promise you the script will be well worth your trip. Uh, that sounds good. I'll be there. Good. Do, Mr. Craig. Hello, Angie. She just started a drug rehabilitation program. Oh, everything's up front with me, you know that. Angie wanted to meet you. She remembers a measure of honesty. Oh. It, it was watching your film that first made me realize what I was doing to myself. The girl in it was so like, like people I'd known, I grew up with, what I was becoming when she came to see me. If the film moved one person to that extent, I may have to review it in a kinder light. I, I can't stay, but I, I did want to meet you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Constance. Now, you think uh, she's going to make it? <sighs> yes, I think so now. And I'm glad. You know, it's a... You're a very dedicated lady, but I don't know how you put up with the daily misery and all. Gives me purpose. I haven't seen you in four months, and you haven't even kissed me hello.
Hello. I just missed you so much. That's why I got so mad. Yeah, so good to see you. Let's get out of here. Hey, I have some friends over. They told me about a little village called Mirage. It's about two and a half hours' drive from here. Been there with anyone else? Does it matter? Yes. No. I haven't been there with anyone else. On to Morag. Right. Don't you listen to enough war stories in the office without uh, looking for more? Hmm? Oh, come on, it's exciting and you enjoy it. Are there many there this year? Many. <laughs> There's too many. Many friends? Ah, uh, no. You don't have friends in Cannes. You have, you have acquaintances. You stand in the lobby of the Carlton Hotel and you talk to anybody, whether it's your agent, your lover, your wife. Everybody's watching to see who's the most important person to talk to. Our careers are squeezed into 12 days. Every precious moment counts. How long can you stay? Uh, just tonight. Can I come back with you? I'll think about that. Place to eat around here? There is only one place for you, monsieur. Chez Michel. It is at the center of the village. Merci. Jesse, I don't want to change. I want to go there right now. You know, impatience is one of your more endearing qualities. Huh? One of the most endearing things about you is that you lie badly. Oh. When I called this morning, was someone there? Why do you ask that? Something in your voice? Well, if there was, should I tell you? I mean, can you tell me you've been with no one else these past four months? Well, there are degrees. Oh, I know there's degrees, but I mean, you're the one who said there would be no strings, no attachments, right? Were you with someone? Since I arrived in Cannes, a very beautiful and insistent young reporter has been trying to interview me. She said, that, you know, what was the word she used? Oh, she was desperate to do the story of my life. <laughs> Why would anyone be desperate for that? That's an interesting question, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> Do you know the girl? Not to my knowledge. What does that mean? Oh, she may be someone from my past or connected with someone from my past. So all I know is she knows more about me than I know about myself. She know about me? Everything. How could anyone know that? She's one of these, what you call, very militant persons. And I guess she just kept, kept at it until she found out everything possible about me. That's simple. Why? I'm not sure. If she asked me why I came to Cannes. What did you tell her? I told her I came to save my life. And you know, she knew. Did she care? Yes, she did. What's her name? It was Gail, Gail McKinnon. I've missed you. I missed you. Thank you. 
was wonderful. Even the coffee was good. <laughs> we needed it. <laughs> Whatever happened to your daughter? Why don't you ever talk about her? Seems a little to say. She wants me to quit the movie business. She says it's cruel, it's capricious, and full of uh, awful people. <laughs> Is she right? Well, it, it's, it's no worse than any other business. It just has better PR. You get more lying in the army in one day than in a movie studio in a year. <laughs> even a month. And after that, we'll take a year and travel the roads of France in the sunshine. What do you say? You tell me about the festival. You see, you are partial to stories about greed and avarice. It's exciting. <laughs> sure. You can't be that jaded. Well, I tell you, I'm an observer. Exile kings on an annual pilgrimage. Outwitting leers with small bands of faithful retainers. Living in pomp without circumstance. Saying things like, uh, I gave her her first job. 75 a week, and now look where she is. And he brought it in... Two and a half million over budget. We had to yank it in Chicago after three days, and now the critics in New York say he's a genius. Ha! They'll tell you the Russians aren't coming this year. No, or the Japanese, or Venice is finished. They speak in English, French, Spanish, German, Hebrew, Arabic, Polish, Dutch, Swedish on the subject of sex, money, success, failure, honest men and thieves, pimps and panders. People have been famous and are no longer. People who will be famous next week or next year, people who will die unknown. Bombs are being dropped, targets chosen. Hills lost and taken. There are floods and volcanic eruptions, wars and preparations for wars. Governments are shaken, funerals and marches. Sounds like fun. It is if you're a part of it. Nations are de disintegrating around us. We're on the terrace of the Carlton for two weeks in springtime. France and all the world is printed on sprocketed strips of celluloid passing through a projector at the rate of 90 feet per minute. Don't come out. How long do I have to wait? Only a moment. We have all night, lover. Hope and despair, beauty and death are being carried around the city in flat, round, shining tin cans. You can come out now. Soon. 
barely recovered enough to talk. If he had been in the same room with Constance, well, uh, you knew her. Hospital throughout France knew Constance. Uh, last September, I treated one of her children. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what she called those pathetic, emaciated pincushions of hers. Her children. Pathetic, emaciated pincushions. Not quite the phrase I would expect from a compassionate doctor. Listen, Inspector, Constance thrived on their misery. She had to help them to drag them up from the depth of despair. She was as high on their anguish as they were high on dope. I knew that he would eventually destroy her as it had destroyed most of her children. You sound like a friend in great pain. Doctor Everyone loved Constance. I didn't mean to wake you, Mr. Craig, but uh, the inspector insisted. I don't ever seem to be prepared for your visits. This is one I really regret having to make. How are you? Alive. Doctor, would you oblige me by giving me a few moments alone with Mr. Craig? A few moments. The little doctor tells me that you were not badly hurt in this accident. The world would have lost its finest filmmaker. Oh, forgive me if I don't uh, share your relief. I understand. Doctor's very protective. You know, if I hadn't taken Constance to Marag, she'd be alive today. No. They would have found you. They? I thought you weren't helping me a little bit in this. Oh, no. Something to do with the drug program, I guess. Yes, yes, of course. To think that her own people, her children, did this terrible thing. Or a pusher. Some successful, soft-spoken bastard sitting on a tile patio who picked up a telephone and gave the order that an annoyance be removed from his life. Damn her, she wouldn't listen to anybody but herself. That, of course, is the natural explanation. Conclusion to which both of us would be led. Would be led? There were two people in that hotel room. You and Constance. Are you saying the bomb was meant for me? A possibility. Oh, no. Why, why would anybody want to kill me? You have no enemies? My life hasn't affected anyone else's in 10 years. You don't make enemies in isolation except for yourself. Constance is dead. Don't... Don't make me live with the thought that she died because of me. Of course I sympathize with your grief. I have mounted investigation. All of Mirage will be heard today. We'll get some news out of them. The moment I hear something, I'll be in touch with you. I hear that you can leave the hospital today. Isn't it a little unusual that an inspector of police in Cannes be investigating a murder in a small village a hundred miles away? <laughs> I have a personal involvement. Yeah, what was that? One Mr. Craig. Your politics? I don't have any. Your movie. I'm told you sold the screenplay to one Mr. Walter Klein. I would have congratulated you much earlier, so I do it now. Congratulations. I'm also told that the deal is set for about 20 million Arab money. Where do you hear that? Where does one hear anything in Cannes as I left? The Carlton was buzzing with the news. I 
I've missed you. I missed you. Why don't we stay here for a week? Maybe even a month. And after that, we'll take a year and travel the roads of France in the sunshine. What do you say? know what's going on. The man was nearly killed. He's in the hospital. By the time he gets out, everything will be settled. We'll be all set up, and he'll start looking at it in a different perspective. We've got to talk to Jesse. What if he finds out? He's found out. And his perspective is the same as always. It's no deal. Jesse, I didn't expect to see you till after the festival. That's obvious. Are you supposed to be out of the hospital? My God, everyone was stunned when they found out what happened. I called the hospital last night. They wouldn't put the call through. Why? To tell me about the deal? I wanted to find out if you were still alive. Constance is dead. Yes. I know, Jesse. Now, that started me thinking. I figured if I could give you some good news, something that would take your mind off what happened. It'll take more than a motion picture to do that. At least sit down. Stay among friends. Well, whatever you decide to do, it's your business. The world shares your problem with you, Mr. Craig. You have a powerful and important statement to make. Is it coincidence that you should stand so close to death at this moment? The discussion is closed, gentlemen. Jesse, Jesse, slow down. Come on, Jesse, have a heart. You just dragged yourself out of a hospital bed. I want to talk to you. Come on, give us a break. Why should I? What kind of a break were you giving me? Jesse. You heard him. Who? The Arab? Oh, come on. He's an oil-rich sheik who wants to play with the movie stars. Jesse, this is perfect. We need this deal. You need it. Now, come on, what's wrong? I don't know. But he's the second person who suggested Constance died for me. Ah, he's talking. Maybe not. There's a lawyer on the Boulevard du Maréchal Leclerc who will put a clause in this contract that'll give you complete control. And it's such small print. These camel merchants won't even be able to read it. Jesse, I'm talking to you as a manager, agent, as a father figure, as your friend. You're not listening. I think that Constance was murdered over my script. Now, pack it in, Murph. It's all over. Not for sale. You understand? Well, what are you going to do? Pull up your tent, run away. Give those maniacs what they wanted. Jess. I've represented you for a lot of years. But it's finished. Right now. I'll tell you the reason you're not going to make this picture. The reason you've lived in obscurity for ten years. You're afraid to fail. Or just plain afraid. He cares about you. Forgive me, but the one thing I'm not up to this trip is you.
there were two people in that hotel room. You and Constance. Is it coincidence that you should stand so close to death at this moment? I'm Constance Dobson. I live in a modest apartment on the Champs-Élysées. I work with the drug addicts you've heard about, and I'm never later than 8.15 at my desk, no matter what kind of a night I've spent. And I'm very partial to green olives. I'll take you everywhere you want to go. Be part of me, Jesse. Sonia, it's Jesse Craig. How are you, Jesse? I'm fine. Is Murph there? He's gone out to dinner. What restaurant? Shy Meal. I see. All right, thank you. Bye, Jesse. I plowed through the script today, cover to cover. It's got potential. I'd like to know how you got a copy of the script. I wanted my opinion. There are some adjustments that should be made, particularly to the ending. It's wild, but it's got to be logical. Basically, all the elements are there. Well, Jess is a great producer, but writing was never his long suit. Considering the last time a movie of yours was ever shot, I was wondering what your long suit is. Drinking, my child. Yes, I can see that. I'll be happy to discuss a polish on the script with you if you ever get your man back to the uh, cocaine and celluloid set. Ian, I wouldn't trust your hands on a typewriter to polish an anagram. Words, dear boy, words. They're only powerful weapons in the mouths of powerful men. Your script does need work. Uh, alcoholic hacks sometimes have the right perspective on life. The journeyman romantics. They know what's real. Now, Sonia neglected to tell me who you were dining with. Well, Miss McKinnon, I wanted some background on you and Ian. I'm just freeloading, old boy. Recognizable syndrome. Murph, I've been thinking about what you said, and you're right. This is my last chance. Ask Ian here. So I want you to make a deal with the Arabs. Give me as much control as you can, though, huh? Jesse, you got it. I have this attorney who... Get him. Just close the deal any way you can. But we're going to make this picture. That's the spirit. Come sit down. We'll talk over the whole... No, no, no. You call me tomorrow when you get the details ironed out, right? I congratulate you, old boy. But when I see a drowning man reaching for a shadow, it worries me. Good night, Ian. You're doing the right thing, Jesse. Excuse me. You may have fooled that desperate agent of yours, or that poor alcoholic. But you are now talking to someone who knows you. And I know what you're going to do. You do? Yes, I do. There's no way you're going to go through with that deal with the Arabs. Just a smoke screen. Is it? Yes. Murphy told me what that Arab said about Constance. About her being an innocent victim. Look, I don't want to hear any more of your theories about my life. Miss McKinnon. It's Gail, and yes, you're going to listen to me. If you were that intended victim, you're going to make sure that who's ever responsible knows that you're going through with that movie. It's going to be all over calm by tomorrow morning. You're setting yourself up as a target. The whole world is a target. There's no middle ground with you, is there? You either don't get on the bridge, or you jump from it. Huh? Just what are you trying to do? I'm going to flush them out. That's what I'm going to do. Who? I, I don't know. Yet. Are you drunk? Drunk? <laughs> no. 
but I'm going to be within an hour, that's for sure. Somehow, I think we both have something to lose. Would you like some company? Not tonight. No. Tonight more than any other night. It may be our last. Do you know what you're getting yourself into? I knew that a long time ago. You don't give up, do you? Never. Do you? Not anymore. Get in. wasn't in your book. It was a chapter you just hadn't planned. Is that it? Don't be so cold-blooded. Let someone care about you. I cried. I cried about you. And I don't cry for anyone. Thank you. Aren't lovers polite once they've left each other's body? So, what happens now? We just wait for someone to take a shot at you? Or blow up your hotel room? Just what is so important about your film that anyone would kill or stop you from making it? That's what I'm gonna find out. If I can't talk you out of it, will you let me help? No, I don't want you involved. Oh, I'm sorry. For a while there, I thought we were involved. No, I've got to do this alone. No. You ever wondered how I know so much about you? All those small little details that would have taken a stranger months of research? Oh, yes, yes, I, I wondered about it. How did I get all that information? Well, I assume you got it by employing your own inimitable style. It's uh, harassment and determination. And it never occurred to you that I might be your daughter? Obviously, that never occurred to me. I'm told you were quite a stud in your day. That you made Errol Flynn look like an old monk. But who told me? One of your many conquests? And what kind of relationship was it? One of those delicious, sophisticated brief encounters? Or was it one of those heavy, nail-scratching, one-night stands? Either way, it really doesn't make much difference, does it? A baby is optional. Who are you? Just a reporter doing a job, Mr. Craig. Some of them are harder than others. You know what I mean. If you were my daughter, you wouldn't. 
I'm part of the new generation, remember us? We spread morals on our toast for breakfast. It's an exciting idea to do it with your old man. <laughs> Goodbye, lover. can't afford to come to Cannes unless one wins. Yes. Especially if you're coming from England. Uh, don't you think that love stories in this day and age are a bit uh, passe? No, not if it's done with flair, style, and sheer good taste. And that is how your film was made? No. <laughs> I certainly wish it had been. Uh, I'll let you be the judge of that. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. Well, don't thank me till you've seen them. I'd find Jesse Craig in a nightclub instead of the bar at the call where you said you'd meet me. That would have been too easy. You know, I'd completely forgotten, Jerry. What do I see? Uh, you can say that you're sorry by buying me a drink. Right. Hey, will you bring the gentleman here a gin and tonic and I'll have another champagne, please, with a little crushed ice. Right. Well, well, I read it. What'd you think? When your script gets to the Pentagon, you may be arrested. It's dynamite, Jesse. It could happen just the way you've written it. Oh, Malcolm Hart wrote it. Oh, come on, Jesse. We've been friends for a long time. I mean, those are the same thoughts that you expressed years ago when we were freezing in that irrigation ditch in Menton. And you were loading film in your camera, and I was trying to protect us from getting killed. Will you help me? Jesse would have to be done under the strictest security and supervision. Everything would have to be cleared through me. That's why I brought you here. Well, then I make a toast. World War III and its prevention. I'll drink to that. Oh, oh. I'd like to be the guy that she's going to meet. You settle for sitting with him? You're a hard man to track down. General Olson, how do you do? Uh, have we met? I mean, I don't remember. General Jerry Olson, one of the highest decorated American soldiers in World War II and Korea. Now a liaison between the Pentagon and the entertainment industry. Is she with the CIA? Oh, I wouldn't worry about it. Miss McKinnon won't be staying. You're right. I won't be. And neither will you. We'll be leaving together. Why? Because I'm going to give you what you really want. Just a minute, would you, Jerry? All right, I'll see you outside. You know, I thought I'd seen the last of you. What do you think you're doing? You want to get whoever killed Constance. Yeah. What's that got to do with you? You set yourself up for bait. Well, I just think I got your first real bite. I don't believe it. You know, I know this is just fun and games to you, but... <laughs> you think to fight was fun? Why would anybody want to get to me through you? Now, will you tell me that? This is real life, Mr. Craig, not the movies. What do you expect the killers to do? Call you and suggest a rendezvous? Complete with passwords? Like I'll meet you in the lobby of the Carlton. You'll know me. I'll be the one that's naked with my hair on fire. All right, all right. Now listen, I'm very sorry for what happened tonight. I really am. But I, I don't know if I can trust you. You see, I don't know what you really want. I don't think what I want 
matters until you get what you want. Who is it who wants to see me? Don't you really know? front. We're taking over this theater as a protest to the insulting decadence and hypocrisy of this festival and the people who run it. It's a mess with you. It took them 25 seconds to completely take over the theater. How many? We are sure. At least a dozen. What do they want? They want to make a protest at uh, the decadence of the festival. A stand for the underprivileged people. I mean, something like that. Yes, yes, but what do they want? We don't know yet. Who's the Liberation Front? Yeah. Fabrizio. The center of attention. Pigs. Slobs. The excrement of society. All dressed up in tuxedos and long flowing dresses, glittering jewelry and false dreams. Or enthralled by images of make-believe. You're touched by a broken romance in an out-of-season resort. But not by the starvation and dying values around you. The people in this theater are not here for politics. They are creators of films, of entertainment. Their political philosophies are private and their own. However, no one here is blind to the suffering that you have just described. Are you telling me that there are no political biases in any of the films in this festival? No statements being made, no propaganda being insinuated? Yes, there are ideologies being expressed, but uh, you cannot run a foot of film without expressing a belief, uh, a thought, a suggestion on both sides, possibly there are answers to the problems that have forced you into this act at any rate. That these people have done you no harm. You have made your statement. It has been noted. Why not let them go? I shall remain here as your hostage if you so desire. No one leaves. Not until justice is served. And we get what we want. 
I suppose a drink's completely out of the question. Oh, what do you want? There are 33 of us being held unlawfully in French jails. Terrorists. Patriots! You will negotiate with the police to have them all released. You, Monsieur Carroll, and no one else. You will bring me proof of their freedom. He's crazy. I will do everything I can, but it is very simple, Monsieur Carroll. Our 33 comrades will be released and given safe escort into Algeria, or I will kill 33 people in this theater. <laughs> Starting with Mr. Jack Conrad. You didn't like my film. It was a piece of trash. Shallow and uninspired. I know. But did you like it? I could kill you right now. Oh, of course you could. If it makes you feel any better, old chap, do so. You have one hour to finalize the arrangements, Monsieur Carroll. If you are not back here by then, these people will start to die. I understand. It will take a certain night just to find out who those 33 patriots are. They are probably scattered in jail in every city in France. We're releasing no one. The problem is local. Right here, we will deal with it. How? Do you guess? Oh, no. Dozens of people would be slaughtered in the confusion. Inspector Le Duc. Yes, yes. I heard it all, Mr. Carroll. There will be no negotiations, Mr. Carroll. But you will give the appearance of negotiation. We will stall for as much time as we can. And then what happens, Inspector? What happens when those trapped animals in there realize they're being deceived? We should take control before that time. We'll start to kill them in there before an hour is up. I could see it in his eyes. No, no, we have surrounded the buildings with police. They can't get out of here. It is the people who will die with them I am thinking of. They are innocent. So where are the athletes at Munich? Not tear gas. Nerve gas. Even more dangerous. That stuff's completely unstable. We haven't even finished testing it yet. Can you think of a better opportunity? But the people around them will be affected, knocked out, and it should only be those within a radius of eight to ten feet. The cartridges must be fired directly and simultaneously at the terrorists by expert marksmen. Organize it. And what if we're wrong? It may not work. What happens then? We will find out. You have less than an hour.
Some pad. Whose is it? Ah, Mr. Craig. I've been expecting you. Well, it seems our paths are destined to cross. Do you think that's curious? Uh, no, I'd say, uh, design. You're right, Mr. Craig. I'm courting you the way Thalberg, Goldwyn, and Mayo were courted. Well, they were men in positions of power. You know. So are you, Mr. Craig. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Your script. Oh, I see. Come. Let me show you my modest tone. Huh. Oh, this is uh, Jerry Olson. He's a friend of mine. Olson? Yeah. I used to own a villa like this just after the war. It's beautiful. And from beauty came destruction. You know, I've been trying to locate you all day. In desperation, I call Miss McKinnon. I understand she knows where you are at all times. Yes, apparently. All right, now that we're here, what shall we talk about? Your movie. Mm -hmm. Rumor has it that you're going to the Arabs for financing. Somehow I find that a compromise you'll find unacceptable. Well, what has that got to do with you? I'd like to finance it. Excuse me, Jules Lefort, Daily Times. You're the question with the microphone. How many terrorists are holding the, uh, the, the audience prisoner? And is there a reason for it? I mean, is it for the liberation of their comrades? What, what else? Is Inspector Ladeau in charge? And will you bring in a special team to, um, to deal with these terrorists? Have you got their names? What are the names of the people that, that are holding them prisoners? Can you tell us one question, please, that we must go? Has anyone been killed in there? All right, all right, all right. Has anyone been killed? Did you get it? Yes, but uh, we had a phone call from Paris, from the president's office. And? We're forbidden to use it. Did you take the car? I never received it. I had no knowledge of it, not until it was too late. But I wanted you to know. Thank you. Do we still go through with it? If we don't, a great many illustrious filmmakers are going to die here in Cannes, along with their films. You know what you have to do. Oh, soda? Plain water, please. You know, about six months ago, a guy slipped on a cake of soap in his bathtub and knocked himself cold and was drowned. We interrupt this program to bring you further coverage of the situation at the Palais de Festival. The terrorists still appear to be in charge. For a first-hand account, we go now to the Palais de Festival and Francois Simon. Now, this scene alone will require at least 40 to 50 missiles, depending upon how many takes are necessary. And then we're going to need some commercial aircraft and... Jesse! Yes? No words. Jesse, come here! For... Excuse me. Tell me, can you be more specific about the kind of armaments necessary for absolute authenticity? Members yeah, what is it? ELF, People's no. Liberation Front. But so far, the police are giving us no names. We understand from Inspector Ledoux, however, that arrangements are being made for the release of these political prisoners. Meanwhile, inside the Palais du Festival, hundreds of people are still being held captive by the small band of terrorists. Jerry, Brett, come in here. Come here, look at this. But ten minutes ago, four police officers arrived carrying briefcases. We were told this is a special unit of men. But no one will tell us what their specialty is. As yet, there is no word from Paris as to the president's reaction to this act of terrorism. Not all the identities of the terrorists are yet known, except the leader. This is Fabrizio Antoni, a well-known anarchist and political agitator. Damn fool. Terrorists have made our lives... A all of those anarchists are damn fools. What do they hope to accomplish in a screaming like that? Assassinations. That looks like the man. What man? When I was friend, taking concerts Paul, he's behind us on the road. I got a glimpse of his face. Someone followed you? Well, I'm not sure. The West German authorities wanted him for questioning after the Olympic massacre, but he could not be found. 
three months later. Murphy's he was, uh, Who? Mrs. Murphy. Brian Murphy, my agent. Yeah, Sonia's wife's with him. I gotta get down there. But don't you be a damn fool. What good can you do down there? I don't know, but I'm not gonna stand around here and watch. But once again, the police were unable to locate him. You know time zone, no stop! You can't stall us, Monsieur Carroll. And we're not bluffing. You have ten minutes to give me an answer. I have told you. The arrangements are being made. Your people are all going to be released. Proof! I want proof. What proof can I give you? This takes time. The police are moving as fast as they can. He's not fooling you for a minute. Ten minutes! Well, the men are ready. We just have to cut the glass out of the projection windows. The cutters have arrived. They've gone to work. How long will it take? Just a few minutes. This is no place for you, Mr. Craig. No, Mr. Easton. I have some friends in there. What's happened? They said nothing, but the deadline approaches rapidly. You must all move outside. All right, now listen. There might be a way to stall them a little longer, give you more time. How? Oh. Well, give them something they might consider more valuable than a few hundred strangers. Give them a hostage that they might feel they can bargain with. You're talking about yourself. That's right. Is it not a little presumptuous to assume that the terrorists would give up 500 hostages for one? Well, they may have a special interest in this particular hostage. Now, believe me, Inspector, it's worth a chance. Jesse, you can't. Well, I tend to agree with Miss McKinnon. One man, no matter how valuable, may not be the answer. But two valuable men. Now, that might appear more attractive to them. I'll go in there with you, Jesse. I think between the two of us would be worth anything they want. You might be able to reason with them. They are no doubt admirers of your politics. We're not dealing with politics here, Inspector. We're dealing with innocent lives. Those are animals up there. That is here to no ideology except anarchism. Inspector. As a man, I cannot condone what you are doing. And as a policeman? I will make them the offer. Good. We're to make this movie, Craig. We ought to stick together. Well, I appreciate the company. No more time. No more time for Jack Conrad. Oh, uh, wait. wait. Uh, the police... The police are willing to make an exchange in the hostages you now hold. They know the only exchange we will accept are 33 comrades rotting in your French jails. Listen to me. Your time is up. Listen to me. At this very moment, Jesse Craig and Brett Easton are outside in the lobby. They are willing to become your hostages in return for releasing this audience. They are ready to make this arrangement as soon as possible. You know what the demands are. No deals will be made. The glass has been removed from the projection windows. We're ready now.
wait here. your friend. I'm sorry. Yeah, he, he could have been. never recover from this tragedy. Oh, it will. By tomorrow. I owe you my life, Inspector. I like your film. Thanks. Three escapes, including the leader Fabrizio. Well, you did all that you could. We're lucky more people weren't killed. What I find intriguing is why the terrorists change their minds, abort with their plan, let everyone go, right after your offer to exchange yourselves for the other citizens. That can't be the reason. It can't. Well, if you were really a special person to them, why did they take you? Excuse me, Inspector. Fred Leek and the others are dead. The nerve gas is gone. Nerve gas? Is that what you were going to use? If it was necessary, yes. Well, I think you've got the answer to your question, Inspector. The terrorists did make a trade for the hostages. Something more valuable to them than returned comrades who have been decimated in French jails. Canisters of nerve gas. There were probably as many terrorists outside as inside. A possibility. Now, if you would excuse us. Jesse, we don't have time to continue our discussion. I'll meet you tomorrow at the Terrace of the Grand Hotel. Yes, all right. I really want this thing, Jesse. I want, I want to close this deal. Good night. Good night. Don't ever scare me like that again. Come on, let's get out of here. You all right? I never went through anything like that in my life. Those crazy guys were ready to start shooting at us. Are you all right? What's the matter with you offering yourself in exchange for us? I just wanted to be helpful. Now, this is, uh, this is Jerry Olson here. He's the weapons man I told you about. We could have used you in there. I wish I'd been in there. Let's get out of here. I need a drink. Five or six of them. One is enough at this time of night. We nearly got our head shot off. She's worried about our dying from cirrhosis of the liver. I love her. Uh, Ian Wadley's dead. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really 
really sorry. Brent Easton. Was he really going in there with you? I believe he was. We, we came here together. What were you doing together? I witnessed your withdrawal scene at the pool and took over as Jesse's agent. Murph, Brett Easton wants to finance the picture. Easton? I've got it lined up with Klein, like you asked for. We're having lunch together tomorrow. Easton might be the better way to go. You don't understand. Not wait any longer. Our comrades are rotting in jails. But we am rot. What do I care about a few failures who allowed themselves to be caught? Would you really have made yourself a hostage with Craig? That was a charade. I would have done anything to stop you. Our people were killed. Don't you understand what we're trying to accomplish? Don't you see the enormity of the task? We're not talking about the liberation of a few people, but of nations, the world. I should kill you myself. Because of Craig, we've been forced to step up our timetable. Now, because of you, we have to act right now. Mr. Craig. Your friend, Mr. Murphy, did you find him last night? Is he hurt? Oh, no, no, he's fine. It's the best thing that's happened to him since the festival began. He's already got some kid writing a, a treatment for the movie. Uh. Talking about Brando to play himself as the lead. Now, uh, I was up front with uh, Walter Klein about my terms, so I'll be up front with you. I have the final cut, and I own the negative. That's the bottom line. Fine, just as long as I get to play the leading role. Yeah, well, that's understood. Okay, you drop your contract any way you like, I'll sign it. And uh, come across with $20 million. Hey, pal, in the past two years, I completed six pictures that grossed over $15 million. I co-produced the last three of them with a profit participation of 25%. Now, the distributors are so anxious to get my next, our next picture that they're bending over backwards to see that I actually get the money's due on paper. Are you asking me to believe that you're going to come up with the entire amount out of your personal pocket? Half. The rest I have in escrow in three Swiss banks. After all this happened, it can't be that simple. Why not? We're both getting what we want. Hi, Jerry. Oh, Jesse, thank you very much for getting here early. I've got to talk to you. Hey, you sounded urgent on the phone. What's the matter? Is there some change in the plan? Well, that's right. You can talk in front of her. It'll be in chapter 29, whether you do or don't. <laughs> Excuse us. Uh, Jesse. Look, I'm sorry, but uh, I don't want you to make this movie. What? The more I think about it, the more dangerous I know it is. That incident at the Palais de Festival. I just couldn't get your script out of my mind. There's no sequence in the script like that. Different sequences, but with the same underlying theme. Terrorism. Now, Jesse, your movie is a powder cake. It could blow up in our faces at any time. And when I say our, I mean our countries. Jerry, you don't understand what the picture's going to I say. I understand you what it's going to do. It's going to give every terrorist group in existence a blueprint to strike at the heart of the Western world. Now, can't you see that? It could happen. The events in your movie could happen. We're alerting the, the, the world to the danger, don't you understand? And the great powers have got to realize that there's a third. Now, why don't we discuss this on the plane? Now, what I'm going to show you in Naples does not cover an attack of the kind shown in your movie. We don't have provisions for it. Now, won't this movie help protect us against such an assault? How do you mean? Well, the picture will take at least two, three months to prepare. Then you've got about 15 weeks of shooting schedule, at least six months post-production, which means you're not looking at a finished picture for at least another year. Now, certainly the Pentagon has enough time to prepare itself against our fictional assault. Well, that may be true, but I just want you to know what you're handling here, Jesse. It's nitro. 
and it has to be handled with kid gloves. Now, if a, if a terrorist group like the PLF ever got hold of a copy of your script... How could they? They don't need to. All they need is the storyline. It wouldn't mean anything to them without the ending. Then that's what we have to protect. All right, the ending of this picture is to be as closely guarded as, let's say, the ending of remember, Close Encounters. There will only be six copies that carry the real ending. I'll devise another for distribution, okay? KT warhead with a devastation field of two and one half miles in radius. Well, again, I'm checking specifics, Colonel Macklin, for the authenticity of the script. Is this the kind of bomb that terrorists might use? It certainly could be. Your security surrounding nuclear weapons must be impenetrable. We blanket every shipment. But you have to realize, Miss McKinnon, that we're dealing here with a highly provocative element every time that we make a shipment or a delivery, and that's human error. Well, how many of those have been in the last decade? More than enough to supply every country in the world. Accidents. For example, last year in Wiesbaden, in Germany, a truck crashed. It had five nuclear weapons. By the time we got there, the weapons were all gone, and the driver was dead. We never got them back. We raided a terrorist group in Italy. We arrested 30 men and recovered two of the weapons. They were planning to launch an attack on the Western Alliance. And the other three? Uh, we haven't found them yet. There was a Boeing 707 hijack this morning, French line. Completely disappeared, no trace. No word of ransom, no word about the passengers. I couldn't help but immediately uh, think of your storyline, Jesse. Well, that's why we're going to make this picture. If we expose the danger, we can protect ourselves against it. This is our first line of defense. The missiles come into action on the first alert. They were going into action right after the first bomb was dropped. Too late? Yes. And this is our second line of defense. It becomes operational 20 seconds after the first. Automatically launched against the enemy. But there would be an instantaneous countermeasure. elegant folks here are saying that the fact that you've got a picture off the ground at all is cause for a celebration. You could be right. Well, I could say I'm surprised to see you here, but you have this habit of appearing when I least expect it. My name seems to have found its way onto the invitation list. I didn't think a policeman drank while on duty. Oh, it's a popular fallacy. Where else would a drink be so necessary? Officially, I'm off duty. And unofficially? Unofficially, I'd like to know how your plan is coming. Plan. To the initiated, it is quite provocative and brave. Are you any closer to finding Constance Dobson's killers? Well, you're initiated. Suppose you tell me. I think you were pretty close and playing a dangerous game. The PLF knows no mercy. If they tried to kill you once, they'll try again. Excuse me, gentlemen. Phone call for Inspector Ledoux. Excuse me. Yes? Yes? Yeah? Uh -huh. Thank you. Interesting piece of information. Another 707 jet airliner has been hijacked, Italian this time. No word from the passengers or crew, no ransom demands, and no blackmail to within 24 hours. Is it coincidence or prophetic? You've read my script too. 
I happen to peruse a copy of it uh, in the line of duty. You know, there have been several hijackings in the last few years. Last year, there was two in the month of August. Now, isn't it a little far-fetched to jump to the conclusion that these events parallel the ones in my script? Possible. But let's just consider it. What if your script came perilously close to some terrorist plan? There would have two alternatives. And what are they? Either destroy or control your script or step up their timetable. Now, if it were true, the pieces of the puzzle begin to fit. Do they not? The storyline of my script calls for three hijackings, if you recall. Oh, there is time. However, if the clock is indeed running, they will have to kill everyone who could warn the world. We could warn them now, you know. Who would believe us? In fact, I remember how foolish the hero in your script looked when he tried to convince the world without proof. In the meantime, a bit of official advice. I would sleep very, very carefully. Jesse? You leaving already? Oh, I have some uh, rewriting to do. Oh, when you need some tranquility, no parties, no handshakes, and no... Uh... No women. Exactly. Delicious creatures, women. But a man's thoughts tend to get clouded with uh, passion. That's for sure. Well, if I don't see you again, I'll, I'll say goodbye now. That had a note of finality to it. Well, the festival is over. I'm going on my boat for a few days. We're testing a new engine. But we'll be in contact by radio. Now, don't hesitate to call me if you have any problems, script or financial. Good night, Jeffrey. Good night. Carry him before morning. Jesse, Gail. Jerry, I've got to talk to you. At this hour, you know what time it is. I don't care what time it is. Come on. What? Did you hear that the second 707 was hijacked tonight? Just disappeared. No communication, no ransom, no nothing. Yeah, well, so what? So doesn't it have a familiar ring to it now, the script, Jerry? Our script. That's what's happening right now. Oh, come on, Jesse. Calm down, huh? I mean, let's try to make sense of what you're talking about. You were the one who said it could happen. Yeah, I said that, and it could. I mean, there's been at least 15 hijackings already this year. Not two within 24 hours. No word and no ransom demands. But how could the terrorists get a hold of your script? Nobody knows about it. Brett Easton knows about it. And if he's with the PLF... I saw him shoot a terrorist the other night at the Palais du Festival. He was covering himself, for God's sakes. Oh, Jesse, Jesse, do I even know a little bit of paranoia here? No, you don't. All right, what do you want me to do? I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. I want you to get on that phone right now, and I want you to call Washington. And tell them what? On what do I base my information? What proof have you got? If I'm right, the clock is already running, and we're almost out of time. Listen to him, please. I'm flying to Washington, D.C. tomorrow morning. Now, when I get there, I will talk to General Grayson, who's on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But I'm warning you, Jesse. The Pentagon will kick this around for days. It would make cooperation on your movie impossible. I don't care about my picture. Now, you get on that phone right now. You want me to phone Washington with a tale like this in the middle of the night. Now, do you know how far I would get? At least you can try. <sighs> Jesse. Please, let me handle this face-to-face -face when I get there. Please, trust me. You did all you could. Not yet. Well, what do we do now? We keep alive.
Do you want to talk to me about it? What are we waiting for? When are you coming to bed? I've got to get you out of here now, tonight. Will you stop being fatherly? Well, isn't that what I'm supposed to be? Hmm. Jesse, hmm? look at me. Let me tell you something. In June of 1955, your secretary, Alice, took a sabbatical for three months. She was replaced by a temporary secretary by the name of Jackie Berman. You were producing Dark Side of Truth, a thriller that was nominated for Best Picture. It didn't win. She wanted it to win because she cared about you. She cared a great deal. I, I don't remember. You don't remember her, do you? Well, you can't be expected to remember every casual affair. You must make the telephone book look like a pamphlet. But let me tell you something. My mother remembered every day and every night. Jackie Berman. You still don't remember, do you? I'm sorry, no, I don't remember. Well, don't feel too badly. I don't remember very well myself. times could I have been, but you were careful. You had a wife and a secretary and a reputation to maintain. I'm sorry I don't remember. So was she. Thank you for telling me. No, I'm still getting you out of here. Stop this. I gotta reach Jerry. Operator. Operator, give me Jerry Olson, please. Mr. Olson has checked out. Oh, when did you check out? About two hours ago. Thank you. Welcome. I'd like to leave you behind. But you and everybody else in Cannes who's read my script is as much of a target as I am. So you're staying right by my side. It's a matter of the gravest importance. What can I do for you, sir? I would like you to arrange for a meeting with the foreign minister immediately. What is the nature of your business, monsieur? Oh, I would prefer not to reveal that over the telephone. I'm leaving for Paris at once.
long do you expect those women and children to last in this heat? What is it you people want? That does not concern you. We are leaving. I'm not leaving till I know my passengers are safe. Your passengers are in no danger. They will be left here. Left here? My crew will not abandon them. Line them up. Begin executing them. All right, all right. All right. All right. Confirm third stage. The terrorists had planned well, but their biggest ally was, as always, surprise. Who in the world, least of all the military or political establishments of the major powers, would dream of an attempt so bold, a plan so ingenious as to engulf them in a desperate nuclear confrontation, each against the other, none of them knowing who had struck first or why. But knowing that survival depended on them striking back against anyone and everyone who might have been responsible, the results would bring destruction to them all. And from the rubble would rise the anarchists, the terrorists, the third world power. It was inevitable. It had already begun. New York, why? We don't have any passengers. They'll never let us land at gunpoint. Even if they would, we don't have enough fuel to get us there. Captain, you were fueled for a flight to New York before you were diverted here. We have done you the kindness of cutting your gross weight down to nothing by leaving your passengers here. That should provide ample fuel margin to reach New York nicely. Yes, it is well thought out. Now, either you start cooperating or one of you dies. At least tell us what the point is. That will become clear to you in time. Of which we have precious little. We have to be airborne and back on your original course in 22 minutes. Now, do you want to work individually or as a team? No radio communications unless I'm in the cockpit. it up. We go. We haven't even checked it out yet. The track is laid, the wheels move, the door will be rolled out. The rest is in the hands of fate. One way or another, she will hit the ground will never be the same again. From another outpost in Morocco, a second hijacked jetliner lifted into the sky with her lethal payload. The destination, Los Angeles. coast of Africa, the third instrument of death begins its sinister vector to intercept and take the place of a sister flight, even now making its way towards Washington. If you're on schedule, you should be in visual contact with Transglobal Flight 112 in seconds. Yes. Yes, it is in sight. Unless something is wrong with the timing mechanism. what you are. The answer to that is that you are now Transglobal Flight 112 bound for New York City. Right on schedule.
Good. I'll update you when I hear from Fernando, which should be almost any time now. Over and out. Sleeping giant awakens. You're gonna stop it, Easton. Move right now. It's too late. You're gonna get on the radio and you're gonna call your people. We're right on target, Jesse. It's a perfect plan. You couldn't have known how close your blueprint was to ours. All we have to do in this quiet, beautiful stretch of Mediterranean is sit and wait for the ends of the superpowers. The United States, Russia, China. Get a hold of Olsen again and tell him what's happening. This is the Teresa MZK 808 calling the Marine operator. This is an emergency, a mayday. Teresa, MZK-808 calling the Marine operator. This is an emergency. This is the Marine operator. What is the nature of your emergency? I need to get in touch with a Mr. Jerry Olson. He's on board Transglobal Flight 393 to Washington, D.C. The plane left Nice Airport about uh, two hours ago. I understood this was a mayday call. Is this a mayday call? Yes, it's a mayday call. Must be given top priority. I've got to talk to this man on Flight 393, Transglobal en route to Washington, D.C. Are you the Teresa? Yes, the Teresa. And your name, monsieur? Craig. Jesse Craig. Now, operator, come on. Now, we're, we're wasting precious time. And you don't know how precious. Operator, 
It's of vital importance that I get through to this flight and the man on it. Now, will you put me through? I have no way of getting in touch with the plane in the air. There must be some way to do it. That would take a special operator. Well, get hold of one. Patch it through the airport or one of the airlines. Isn't that possible? I believe it is, but I'd have to check. Then check as fast as you can. Captain's radio. An urgent call, sir. Urgent? Oh. Did they say who it was that was calling? I think it's coming from France, but I'm not certain. I don't know who's making the call. Mm-hmm. Okay. Captain? This is General Olson. General, I hope it isn't a girlfriend that can't meet you at the airport. Uh, hello? This is Jerry Olson speaking. your party on board Trans Global Flight 17. Go ahead. I repeat, this is Jerry Olson speaking. Jerry, it's Jesse. Jesse. I might have known. Only Jesse Gregg would track me down en route. Look, will you stop worrying? I'll tell the Pentagon everything you told me. Jerry, it's definite. Easton is a terrorist. He's the head of the PLF group. I've just killed him. You what? Now you shut up and listen. It's happening right now. The terrorists have hijacked three commercial airliners, just like in the script. They're going to blow up three others and take their places. Just like in the script, don't you understand? Yeah, I understand. They're going to take over the flight paths of the airliners bound for Los Angeles, New York City, and, and Washington, D.C. Don't worry, Jesse. This isn't the only flight in the air to Washington, D.C. at the moment. Can you still hear me? Jerry? No. This is the Teresa MZK-808 calling the Marine operator. This is an emergency call, Mayday. This is the Marine operator, Teresa. What is the nature of your emergency? Look, I haven't time to explain it to you, but you have to put me through to NORAD or the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. as soon as possible. There's a delay on long distance lines of three hours. In one half of an hour, the whole world is going to be blown up. Now, don't tell me there's a three-hour delay. You've got to get me through to Washington, D.C. I'm sorry, Teresa, but there's a telephone strike that went into effect at noon today. A what? I'll put you on the list, and as soon as we can get a line out, I'll call you, Teresa. Operator! Well, I wonder how much more money they want an hour. You've got to! Operator. This is the Marine operator. Look, try and put me through to the NORAD base in Naples. Colonel Macklin. Flight Center, this is uh, Transglobal Flight 814. Do you copy? Transglobal Flight 814. We copy. We have you on our scope. You are 100 miles from touchdown. New York Flight Center, this is Transglobal Flight 112. We need a weather and position check. Weather fair, high thin clouds. Wind light at five knots from northeast. Visibility, 15 miles. We place you on our scope at vector crossing, 75 miles out. Washington Flight Center, this is Transglobal Flight 393. Three. We've just crossed the 30 mile vector at 19,000 feet. Copy. Thank you, Transglobal 393. Three. Contact Approach Control Center at 118.3.
I just can't believe what you're telling me, Craig. How can I? We're wasting time, and every second is precious. I don't care how fantastic it sounds, it's happening. We've got to alert NATO and Washington right now. You expect me to make these calls without the slightest shred of any evidence of any kind, proof of any kind? I can't do that, Craig. Colonel, I'm placing the fate of the world in your hands because there's no one else I can talk to who can do anything about it. I can prove it to you. You know, Jerry Olson was on Transglobal Flight 393 today. Yes. It's been blown out of the sky. Just like I told you, and another plane's taking its place. How you get through to it, you'll find that there's a different captain at the controls. That should convince anyone you're talking to. I can do that, but I can't. Now look, if you don't believe me, the world is finished. But if you have the slightest doubt, if one word of what I've told you is the truth, you've got to stop those three planes. I'll get NORAD onto it right away. I'll call Washington. I'll put the alert out through every NATO base. Give me your call number. It's Teresa MZK808. I'll get back to you right away. I'm not going anywhere. This is SAC headquarters to all command. Launch immediately airborne command aircraft, Ancho 1 and 2. Break. Ancho 3. Advise immediately of your time remaining on station. This is not a drill. Scramble aircraft. This is no drill. Condition real. This is Transglobal Flight 814. We're at 24,000 feet. Transglobal Flight 814. Contact Los Angeles Tower at 120.3. You're clear for approach. Use runway 25 right. Tiger Flight, continue flying to Angel Sporty. Turn further right to 020 degrees. Transglobal 112. You're clear for the approach. Descend and maintain 9,000 feet. Intercept the ILS at the outer marker. Report at the outer marker. Roadrunner lead, this is Hancho 3. This is not the drill. Mark your missiles. Washington approach. This is Transglobal Flight 393. We're at the outer marker. Transglobal 393. We copy. Blackjack flight, we have positive target identification. Los Angeles 814, you are 25 miles from touchdown. Continue present rate of descent. New York 112, you are 27 miles from touchdown. Los Angeles 8 
14, you are 22 miles from touchdown. Your approach looks good. Tiger flight, aboard. Missile command has logged on target. New York 112, you are 23 miles from touchdown. Hancho 2, this is fleet command. Positive lock on target. Ready to fire. Washington, 393, you are 16 miles from touchdown. Missile command has lock on target. Ready to fire. Scared. Hold me. <laughs> <laughs> 